Hi, I'm Lindsay. And I'm Marshall. Welcome to Tumble, the show where we explore stories of science discovery. Today, we're going to find out how to become an astronaut. Lots of people dream of wearing spacesuits, floating in zero gravity, and exploring other planets. But how do you become one of the few people who gets to go up to space? We're talking to a NASA astronaut about her journey into outer space. It started when she was a kid, and it took her all the way up to the International Space Station. Talk about shooting for the stars. Today's question comes from Margaret. My name is Margaret. I'm eight years old. I want to know how to become an astronaut. Margaret sent us her question about becoming an astronaut in a video. She's wearing an orange astronaut costume and standing in front of her science fair project. She told us how she caught the astronaut bug. On my birthday, I watched a video of Apollo 11 blasting off to the moon. And then I started liking space. I now want to become an astronaut. I think to be an astronaut, you need to go to college to be an engineer and then apply to NASA. I want to become an astronaut because I really want to go to Mars. Whoa, really sounds like Margaret has a plan. You go for it, kid. I wanted to find out for Margaret and every kid who dreams of going to space what it really takes to become an astronaut. And I thought a real astronaut could definitely help. So my name is Dr. Serena Anand-Chancellor, NASA astronaut, and I flew on board the International Space Station during Expedition 56 and 57. And I can't believe you talked to an actual astronaut. That's like, you don't get much more rock star than that. (laughs) Serena was so cool, and dare I say it, down to earth. (laughs) (laughs) But was she actually down to earth on this call? Yeah, she was. <laughs> she, she was in an office. And I gave Serena Margaret's question. It turns out that Serena got interested in space in literally the exact same way. Yeah, so I was just about Margaret's age. I was around eight years old. And I got very interested because I used to really enjoy watching the space shuttle launch over and over. And I was absolutely fascinated by launches, watching the shuttle go into space. Oh, wow. So I guess we know the answer to the question of why do kids want to become astronauts? They've watched a space shuttle launch, and it's awesome. You could say that rockets ignited their dreams. We would watch the astronauts float around and be able to see the Earth and all the science they were doing. And it was easy for me to picture myself up there in space living and working. Serena didn't just daydream about being in space. She started learning about it. Yeah, so certainly when I was in elementary school, I remember I was in the fifth grade and and we had a club in our school called the Young Astronauts Club. And I loved it because we would learn all about space and the space shuttle. And then as I got older and was in high school, I, I did go to space camp. Space camp. Space camp gave Serena a real idea of what it would be like to be an astronaut. She decided to keep working towards it and went to school to become, like Margaret suggested, an engineer. And so I first did engineering in college, but then I went to medical school after that and trained in a special type of medicine called aerospace medicine. Becoming a doctor gave Serena her first in at NASA. She was hired to be a doctor for astronauts and their families. And I did that for about three years. And then it was time for another astronaut selection. Wait, wait, what, what's astronaut selection? Is it like where you line up for a kickball team and the astronaut captains are like, I'm taking Billy? <laughs> no, it's the time when NASA basically sends out a note saying, we're hiring astronauts. NASA usually has an astronaut selection. Right now, it's about every four years, so there should be another one coming up here soon. And all you do is apply online. It's very easy. Just like everything, just apply online. (laughs) NASA gets flooded by thousands of applications, and each one is reviewed by current astronauts. Who are doctors, look at all the doctor applications, and the astronauts who are pilots, look at the pilot applications. And we really just look at the whole person and what sort of experiences they've had. Have they ever had any experience in what we call operational or extreme environments? Extreme environments, like 
doing doctoring while skateboarding? (laughs) It's not exports. They're places or situations where you're mostly cut off from the rest of the world, like you would be in space. So you mean like places where you can't get a soda at the corner store? (laughs) Exactly. So back to Serena, she applied to become an astronaut in 2009. And then she waited to see if she got the job. I was actually waiting to eat lunch with a friend in my car in the parking lot of a Chinese food restaurant. Sitting in her car, her phone began to ring with a number that she knew was coming from NASA. You don't know when you pick up that phone if they're going to say, hey, welcome, congratulations, uh, welcome to the NASA family, or if they're going to say, hey, you know, good luck next time. So you're, you're a little anxious when that phone call comes across. Serena knew that the next moments would mean either her dream had come true or she'll have to try again. When I finally answered it, um, they basically said, welcome to the astronaut family. And and I was very, very excited and I basically got off the phone and, and called my parents right away. That must have felt really incredible. Like, you know, I've applied for some things and gotten accepted to one or two, but... This is like that times a thousand. Yeah, definitely. Or infinity. (laughs) Yeah. So what happened next? She just got on a rocket, outer space, that's it? Oh, no. It's far from it. She had two and a half years of training as an astronaut candidate before she could officially become an astronaut. You learn about the space station and how it operates. You learn how to operate the robot arm. You learn how to do spacewalks. You learn the Russian language, because right now that's how we get to and from the space station. Wait, she had to learn a new language? That's like a whole other thing. Yeah, NASA works closely with Russia's space agency. And so astronauts learn Russian in order to work with cosmonauts and launch from Russia. Well, so besides having to learn Russian, which is one of the most difficult languages in the world, What else did she have to do? So Serena got lots of practice in the kinds of extreme environments that we talked about. So they didn't let her buy soda at the gift shop. (laughs) While she was an astronaut candidate, she did research in Antarctica. And later she worked as an aquanaut in an underwater laboratory. Okay, so then the next step is astronaut. Well, she made it through her training, but it's one thing to be called an astronaut and another thing to actually go into space. I think a lot of people think you get into the astronaut corps and fly within two years. The average wait time is 7 to 10. Wait, wait. So you do all that work, like you go to Antarctica, you learn Russian, you stay underwater for a long time. And then you wait on Earth for seven years? What do you do? Just like put on a space suit and walk around your house and be like, astronaut here. Hey, hey everybody, I'm an astronaut. Did you know that? (laughs) Well, astronauts do lots of important work for the space program when they're not in space themselves. Most of the time you're in the astronaut office, you're not preparing for space flight. You're actually supporting the people who are flying on board the space station. So wait, there's an astronaut office? <laughs> yes. I hope it's pretty nice. Do they at least have the cool swivel chairs? I hope there's pictures of space. <laughs> <laughs> so in the astronaut office, Serena got to work on medical issues that happen on the space station. And she finally got the next most important call of her life. She was assigned to a mission. It's another two to two and a half years at that point of training before you actually launch on that mission. Seriously, where is the instant gratification in all of this? Spoiler alert, there is none. (laughs) But finally, finally, on June 6, 2018, Serena hopped onto a space shuttle with two Russian cosmonauts, launched into space, and flew all the way to the International Space Station. She realized that nothing had really prepared her for life without gravity. You're floating everywhere. You're not very well controlled. You're not very graceful. Um, so you're really just learning how to move in that environment for the first first week or so, honestly. It takes some time. That's crazy. I mean, I have a hard enough time just flying normally. <laughs> I can't imagine if I was also weightless. Like on an airplane or just you can fly? <laughs> <laughs> when flapping my arms. It is difficult. So when Serena got adjusted to life on the ISS, she got to work. And a lot of her work was doing science about human life on Earth. 
Yeah, so I think what people need to understand that life science is research. So the research involving the human body or diseases, we do a lot of it on space station, and 70% of that research is devoted towards disease on Earth. It has nothing to do with space flight. Nothing. No, I always thought that research in space is about space, like how to deal with aliens, how to uh, speak Martian, how to grow plants on the moon, um, baking space cookies, that sort of stuff. (laughs) I thought that too. But it turns out the space station is actually an incredible laboratory to study disease. Certain cells really like to grow in space. They grow just like they do in the body. Serena was working with the type of cells that help form cancerous tumors. In Earth labs, they don't survive out of the body long enough for scientists to study them. So we found that in space, however, those cells really like to grow. And I think it's because they're floating and they feel like they're floating just like they do in the body. That's so interesting. And maybe the cells always wanted to be astronauts too. Serena was able to test new types of cancer drugs on the cells to see how well they work. And so if you think about it, that's an experiment that doesn't really benefit spaceflight at all. It doesn't help us get to Mars. It doesn't help us get to the moon. It really helps one thing. It helps cancer here on Earth. Wow. So in addition to being awesome, astronauts could also help cure cancer. I never thought of the ISS as like a hard-to-get-to medical lab. Very few people do, even astronauts. I didn't know how much science would help people down here when I got on board the ISS. And so when I got up there and started doing all the cancer research and everything, it was just one of the neatest things because I felt like we were really helping people. Serena told me that the process of becoming an astronaut and doing research in space taught her a lot about how science works. Science itself is never finished. It's never done. So if someone tells you that science for something has already been discovered and they know all the answers, that's never true. Science is always changing. And if you are a scientist, you should always be questioning everything around you. So being an astronaut is not just about getting to launch into space. It's about being a scientist, being really patient. And working really hard. And doing research that is really important for people back on Earth. Even those of us who don't want to give up going to the corner store to get a soda. (laughs) Exactly. And Serena had some great words of advice for Margaret and every kid who might want to be an astronaut when they grow up. Yeah, so I tell Margaret that spaceflight is one of the coolest things you could ever do being an astronaut is one of the coolest things you could ever be. And don't let anybody ever tell you you can't be it. Don't let anybody ever tell you it's too hard or too difficult and too many people are applying. I would tell Margaret to, number one, do exactly what she wants to do in life. Make that her passion. And then don't worry about what NASA wants you to do. I would tell Margaret to just love learning. And if you really want to be an astronaut, then just persevere, which means just work hard, stay determined, and you can be whatever you want to be. That's really great advice from an astronaut. And if you're not taking advice from astronauts, who will you take advice from? That's a great question for our listeners. Do you have an idea of what you want to be when you grow up? If you do, ask a grown-up to help you research people who are doing what you want to do, or maybe you already know them. Then send them an email or an adorable video asking how they ended up where they are today. Lots of grown-ups love to give advice to kids, so don't worry. You might learn something that surprises you. Thanks to Dr. Serena Anand Chancellor, NASA astronaut, Also thanks to Brandy Dean at NASA for coordinating our interview. Very special thanks to Margaret for sending in her awesome question. Sarah Lentz is our head of partnerships. I'm Lindsay Patterson, and I wrote and produced this show. And I'm Marshall Escamilla, and I made all of the music. Thanks for listening, and stay tuned for more stories of science discovery.